Good evening, directors, staff, and members of the public listening. I will now call this, Jan this June 22nd, 20 2021 Committee of the Whole meeting to order. No, no, you look at local, local state and federal all emergency, emergency declarations and we guidance have regarding the COVID 19 pandemic. This meeting of the Minneapolis Board of Education is being conducted in, accord in accordance with Minnesota Statute 13 with members participating remotely via interactive technology. This is a discussion meeting and no votes will be taken. The meeting is being live streamed on our website and on channel 15 and the recording will be available in both places. Directors and presenters, please remember to mute yourselves when not talking to avoid background noise. And for the benefit of all of us, and in particular, for our interpreters and for those using closed captions, please remember to speak clearly, slowly, and into your microphone. Director Pauly, will you please call the roll for the record? Director Arneson. Director Alameen. Here. Director Ali. <coughs> Director Surio. Here. Director Ernst. Director Jordan. Here. Director Caprini. Present. Director Polly is here. Chair Allison. Here. Student Rep. Governor Meskel. Yay. Thank you. Mm, yes, Our topic this to evening is an enrollment update. Directors, we will take questions Director after the staff presentation. Superintendent, Superintendent Graf, please go ahead. Graf, shake up more Lurachita. Thank you, Ryan. So give me the reminder to unmute. So uh, thank you, Superintendent, uh, Chair Ellison, uh, members of the board. It is my pleasure to have the opportunity to present uh, enrollment numbers uh, uh, to you tonight. And, um, you know, I was lamenting before I, uh, you know, as we were putting together this presentation that, uh, you know, there's a lot of numbers tonight and a lot of, you know, some charts, but uh, certainly not the, the, the color and, 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 I think in some regards, the excitement 
that previous presentation in the past. Um, but, I, but I also want to articulate that uh, the numbers you'll see tonight are part of a larger narrative, as the superintendent mentioned, relative to the comprehensive district design and our promise uh, of delivering a well-rounded education regardless of zip code. Under the goal, three goals of equity, academics, and sustainability. Uh, again, as a, as a reminder for uh, uh, folks, uh, the, the premise is to, is to centralize magnets, uh, have stronger community schools. These stronger community schools will allow us to increase market share uh, and as a direct response to, to parent needs. Uh, and so as we adjust at boundaries, um, and, and as a result, and you'll see the numbers tonight, um, it allowed us to, to really invest resources into literacy, uh, into ensuring that every student across the district next year has access to fifth grade music, uh, that we don't have such large uh, class uh, variations in enrollment uh, between our high schools, depending on where the students live, uh, that we're able to provide mental health support. We will have mental health support now across the district in every school regardless of zip code uh, stem for all uh, you know i was surprised as we went to cdd that over half of our students that did not have access to after school programming and so um, again through stranger community schools will be able to have after school programming uh, equity training for all and of course a, a focus on climate uh, so the numbers do uh, and will tell a larger story in terms of a brighter promise for our students uh, beginning uh, fall 21. Okay, to go to the next slide. So tonight we'll talk about uh, enrollment projections. Uh, we'll share uh, uh, some of the impact of, of the first year uh, in terms of the reduction in small schools. Schools below 250 or below. Uh, we have rates of identifiable sites. Those are sites as of October 19. Our integration plan at the time were 86 percent or above uh, students of color, and so we're seeing a dramatic reduction in our RS sites. <clears throat> Uh, schools that are 80% or more okay, previous lunch, we're seeing a slight reduction there. Uh, and then we'll long talk long about, uh, take a look at some magnet long school long data long in particular. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Associate Superintendent Cox walk us through uh, the appeals so process and some of the data associated with that. Because again, um, this is, uh, anytime you're, you're um, uh, going through a boundary change and, and making adjustments uh, relative to enrollment, um, you know, there, there are some challenging cases and situations that, that we want to respond to. And and so Associate Superintendent Cox has helped lead uh, us on this process and she'll have an opportunity to share that process with you um, and some data uh, that we've seen as a result of that. Next slide. So, อ่าอิมิเกรชั่นคือสิ่งที่ทําให้เกิดผลเกี่ยวกับการเงินเดือนของประเทศไทยในปี um, of uh, 1329, so next year uh, we're going to be down 1329. Um, you know, this is a result of the uh, uh, also within this part, you are going to see uh, uh, some impact uh, regarding the CD. Uh, we're looking at uh, 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 the east and split roughly uh, uh, about 25 percent of losing as a result of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be losing as a result of uh, 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 the CDD. Uh, 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 both are certainly better than what uh, 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 you uh, 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 see the decline in enrollment and under the premise of the conference enrollment. เท่านั้นเราเลยดีคลายเรามันน่าจะใช้ให้เดี๋ยวว่าเชื่อจะต้องใช้กันได้วันนี้เจอเลยนะอ่าโมโตสเตติชงนึงกุชิเนี่ย
ยากับเป็นมัวคอนเซสต์เซนเนอร์ตัวเขาว่าดิสทริกต์เดนอ่ะเออคำว่าจะเต็งเก็บป้าวันนึงมัวหลอดชิชิ่งเก็บไปทบ
ลองตัวแอคาเดมิกเอ็นเทอร์เกรชั่นเนี่ยคนเดียวเขาเขาก็ยังบอกไอเดียเท่าเจ้าเช่นกันนะในน้องร้องเลยค่ะน้องเดีย
represent roughly 34% yeah, of the population. Yeah, plus percent the population. Yeah, they actually represent 57% of the total yeah, request. Yeah, all the shorty are just that in some cases they are actually uh, 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 over proportion. Yeah, but most of the people are young. What we're finding is that we're seeing more middle income, upper income, as well as uh, those kinds of qualified for English lunch. But there's a more diverse uh, group of African American families that are choosing to participate in our magazine program. I want to move down and take a look also at special education. One of the commitments under the comprehensive design is that we wanted to Make sure that students with special needs have the opportunity to participate in the Magnus program. Special education students represent 10% of our children in the Magnus program. Special education students represent 10% of our children in the Magnus program. Based on the request, and then based on the personal enrollment, and then 21% of the students that are in the Magnus program. Then based on the personal enrollment, and then 21% of those requested. So, so that's the positive. Okay, you're seeing also really positive things. Ah, positive. Just to help each other, just to help. Um, one thing to point out is that our white student population here, um, you know, is actually under. So, so you see 40% of enrollment, uh, 19% of requests. So um, we need to do a, a better job uh, recruiting our white families. Uh, so uh, and that's why I'm going to bring up the fact that we need to do a better job recruiting our white families. And I think that uh, certainly uh, there's efforts uh, underway uh, to do that. Uh, but I, I will say that following uh, national trends with the integration of racial integration and racial identified schools, you do see a trend of first year low income families coming back, right? So the district coming back, integrating and then your white families will tend to follow shortly after. But this is really good news. You know, one really positive trend, and it's going the direction that we anticipate. To the same for sixth grade. You must say that you are going to get the proportionality here. Can you say that you are going to get the proportionality here? Can you say that you are going to get the proportionality here? Can you say that you are going to get the proportionality here? Almost through a percent of requests, so that's a good sign. Yeah, half percentage of enrollment, yeah, half percentage of requests, not yet. Half percent. Let me know. Let me share it. No. Yes, I thought they can. Yeah, yeah. So you see the under participation of white families. Yeah, come on, be the John. You see the motor of the proportionality representation for African American and Hispanic families. Yeah, yeah. Let's not necessarily a negative thing. Yeah, maybe they just don't run it. Just something to take a look at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're not offering the opportunities from an equity lens uh, for our families, uh, both from a racial standpoint, uh, economic, as well as special needs. Uh, and, uh, High school. Uh, Maggie Kern versus projected demographic sixth grade. Uh, again, this is showing um, uh, our previous lunch and student color populations. Um, again, those sixth grade classes, so we talked about kindergarten. Mm -hmm. At the middle level, yeah, six, seven, eight, eight, that new level school. would be um, at a Franklin in particular yeah, so Franklin. Um, or Anderson. Uh, yeah, Anderson. Um, those, those would be new grade yeah, levels. Yeah, yeah, right? So this is uh, the first grade yeah, levels yeah, um, level. that don't include transition yeah, numbers. Yeah, so transition you do see uh, Anderson's more integrated, yeah, both yeah, uh, yeah, economically yeah, as well as yeah, yeah, color. Yeah, Franklin as well. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, Jefferson. Jefferson is very interesting. Um, you know, we're not meeting that goal yet. Uh, we do see a, a slight uh, decrease in students of color, uh, but we are seeing more free English lunch students uh, applying. Um, and, and so again, additional work to do in that area. Uh, Jefferson is another location where uh, the families really love that school. Jefferson, yeah, you call what they are not telling you. Yeah, look, which is a really positive thing. Yeah, how do you call how they are doing? So number of families shows to stay, which is um, which is actually a good thing. Oh, you know, she moved to the college. And there's opportunities for those families that have a quality education, and certainly uh, room for other families to join the Jefferson family. I just see a nice reduction in Solomon as well. Moving from magnet schools, though, I, I do want to the point out that we are seeing a lot of students who are not going to the school. So, you know, if you're in the boundary change, uh, you know, one of the goals was to equalize mm. the enrollment yeah, across the schools. Um, so, yes, five schools, 2021, uh, that uh, as an end of the year, um, had less than 250. Yeah, the and so, the into next year, uh, you have three. So, uh, that's a positive, uh, certainly a positive. One of those schools. 
um, Paul is right on the borderline. Um, I, I really anticipate we probably could end up with two. Um, 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 year, um, um, but as of now, five um, is um, um, This is a bit more dramatic. Um, uh, in October 2019, um, um, we had 24 schools Young while I want to move to ninth grade placement. Uh, you know, one of the uh, administration uh, 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 and really to the in the high school. Uh, we saw the high school so that so high school and 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 the high school 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 the it was very recently that we had high school but Fair Henry Heritage North Roosevelt. Slightly Make 
high school then. More big your chief and board your meal and here and yet to the fear like the Shando Lut District law, you can have two Shando Shando Lut District, Gala Mukang the Hall, and any particular Jumbe, a Sua Shong, Beta Bailu Shong Dalan, and the Menu and here Jumbe, Yongju, Yongju, two dollar. Hana here, Kajon Kakian, a big here, Kajon Bay Moor. ไอ้นะอีลูเมกเนี่ยไฮสคูลไอ้เนี่ยช่องเคยเนี่ยมั่วชาเป็กเกอร์ฝั่งปัวจะมีอะไรเห็นตัวเกิดจีนย่อเข
Yeah, to help them through the transition. And we had many families who took us up on that. I wanted to end just by saying there were a lot of lessons learned. First of all, this was a very challenging process. Um, and I think our, our team really had a lot of empathy for families, um, and for their students, and the appeals of applications that they would put in. Um, we definitely need to work on making this process more equitable and accessible to all our families. We did see a Thank 
Well, thank you, Senior Officer Moore, for your, your presentation. Um, Chair Ellison, at this point, this does conclude the, our portion of the presentation. And so I think we stand ready to hear any questions uh, that board members might have, and we can hopefully respond to them this evening. Um, or if not, we can certainly follow up in, in writing. Thank you, Superintendent. What's your superintendent? Um, and Associate Superintendent, Cox. Superintendent Cox. Cox. And Senior Officer Moore, thank and you for that presentation. Moore, board members, if you, if you are remote, if you use the raise your hand feature, um, so let me know if you have a question or a comment. Directors who are at in the assembly room, room which you like Director Arneson Young. Um, I'll start with um, Director Caprini. Director Caprini. Thank you, Chair Ellison, um, and Chair thank you, Senior Elson. Officer uh, Moore Senior and Officer Cox, Senior Officer Cox for the presentation. Um, two questions. Um, first, um, what are the efforts that schools are uh, doing to recruit families? Um, and that's part of it. And then specifically white families. So that's two parts. And then the second one is, um, were any of the schools that uh, students were placed in for any of the staff from the school, the receiving school, um, part of the conversation in, you know, um, what their school has to offer, you know, uh, just this whole transition piece. Um, because I guess I feel like it's important, it would, have, it would be important to have uh, I'll just use Henry as an example. If there was a parent who's, who didn't want their child to go to Henry, I would hope that uh, Principal Abdullah and his team would be able to um, be a part of uh, talking with that family to support them in feeling um, welcome and more comfortable. And uh, so, so I guess that's that's my question. So, so what's up? Chair sure, Ellison, if I may respond, sure, Ellison, Director, yeah, Director yeah, Papini, thank you for the question. Director I'll start with um, just kind of providing an overarching view of the, the yeah, recruitment yeah, question you had. Um, I know we had this discussion, I think it was after the first lottery and the, the reaction to what we had for numbers, um, but subsequent to that lottery, there was um, an effort on a number of schools to provide greater outreach beyond just the, what we would traditionally have when we had in-person learning going on. Um, you mentioned Patrick Henry High School. I know Principal Abdullah um, did an outstanding job of putting together a video and providing that um, through social media. That was something that was shared with other schools. And uh, in that sharing, there were many more videos that were produced and put out there. Um, in some cases, we had partnerships. We had schools that were now feeder schools to different um, middle schools where they partnered together. And so they provided that, that resource to families to, to take a new look or a, a consideration of their school. In addition to that, the idea of recruitment and uh, um, messaging for families continues to happen as we've gone through our interview and select process. We have new positions in many schools, new staff, and so there's a greater um, amount of outreach that's happening now with those new teachers coming into the building. Um, wrapping up, you know, what they just finished this school year. So we anticipate they'll have some of those discussions in early, um, in August, you know, when they return back to kind of welcome families in and do a, an, uh, a return to school. Um, we also anticipate that there will be more potential uh, recruitment to families as we start our school year up, as word of mouth happens. Um, you know, when students are actually in the building and they're seeing the new, new facility that they have now as part of their um, trajectory for whether it be elementary, middle, or high school. Um, so we're looking at a, a number of things there in terms of the recruitment that will be happening going forward, but certainly wanted to highlight what was being done at the school level from principals um, communicating through social media with videos 
as well as reaching out to their neighboring schools or their transitioning schools. Um, and I'll ask maybe Senior Officer Moore or Associate Superintendent Cox if you have other pieces to add because I know we have, in addition to our community schools, we have magnets that have done a lot of work and also I know our special education department has really uh, helped promote the, the transition for families. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent. I, I, I can just add, I know that our principals uh, work really hard in, in terms of looking at this work as part of their climate efforts. Uh, and so uh, uh, principals were given a list of, of students that were transitioning uh, to their schools, and they made phone calls. I uh, saw uh, at locations uh, thinking, in fact, of a really phenomenal uh, session that the principal of Marcy, you know, as they went through a great configuration, for example, and uh, the middle schools, uh, principals that would, would be the new receiving schools, were all present and presented about their schools, and it was great to watch the principals present to the, new, to the families that they would be receiving about their schools. Uh, so there was a lot of work uh, between schools and between principals uh, for transitioning schools, but also as you mentioned, uh, lots of virtual open houses, uh, lots of personal phone calls to families answering questions. For example, I know the principal at North High uh, uh, called parents, so she, she diligently called parents and welcomed them to their uh, to North High. Uh, so I would just like, want to call out that there was a lot of effort uh, made by our principals. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, there's a, there, we tried uh, and, and I'm interested to see what the final results look like. Um, we did uh, have some early childhood opportunities um, at, at some of our magnets um, in which we were looking at having integrated early childhood opportunities um, at Sheridan, Jefferson, uh, um, and Sullivan. And so we were, we were trying, we know, typically on um, early childhood programs that predominantly for families that qualify for English lunch, uh, but, but we actually bought more seats in other locations across the district so that we could be able to have integrated opportunities at the early childhood. Again, the goal is that those families at the younger ages will participate in the early childhood program at those magnets and then we get admission to the young program. Uh, and so, again, those early childhood programs are more economically and racially integrated than those for kindergarten. So that's something that uh, parents are bought into, and it's a win-win. Um, if you're able to get uh, families choosing integrated uh, early childhood, and we know that the positive impact of early childhood is case on academic feasibility, integration strategy and academic achievement strategy, um, having early childhood programs uh, to support integration. So those were some efforts, uh, uh, Director uh, Caprini, um, and, and I think they're yielding some positive results. And so, um, but I, I think a lot of this work, uh, I'll be quite honest, it's word of mouth. You know, as we're transitioning, the climate work is going to be critical. Outreach, uh, making sure that, that um, you know, as, as such as Dr. Cox mentioned, it's the personal phone call um, and, and just welcoming those families to the schools. Uh, and, and that seems to work. I do believe that those numbers will increase, uh, both at, you know, our, our, our white families as well as students, uh, families who uh, don't qualify for free and just want to it nationally in, in the research. Um, the numbers for the first year actually was very positive uh, to me. And, and I always have to remind myself, this is the first year that we're doing this. And we're coming out of a pandemic. Uh, it's, and we're coming out of a, a racial reckoning uh, in the city of Minneapolis. There's a lot going on that impacted our ability to deliver. So when I look at the numbers that I'm seeing, um, it, it really uh, supports my, my belief. I get kind of fired up in, in terms of the values, morals of folks in Minneapolis um, and, and their desire uh, to have economic uh, and integrated learning opportunities. So, so we'll get there. But it's certainly much better than I uh, and hope for uh, for the first year, um, but I, I, wanted, I want to call out our principal uh, for their hard work and making those personal phone calls and, and having the virtual open houses uh, across, and, and I see them working better together, and, I, and I'm starting to see us move towards a one Minneapolis um, and moving away from this idea of competition, right, to this idea that if everyone's healthy, uh, then we're all healthy, right? And, and so, uh, um, those are some things that I saw. That's awesome. And um, first, I want to uh, apologize to Associate Superintendent Cox for um, 
not using her correct title. I refer to as senior officer, so I apologize for that. Um, I asked the question because I wanted the community or the, 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 the listening audience to hear the answer because I'm, I'm, I'm aware of all of the work that's gone into recruiting families and I'm extremely proud of, of, of the work that they've been doing. Um, so I, I just wanted uh, the community to hear the district say, um, you know, what's actually happening and uh, had a lot of those principles on their backs and the co collaboration that's happening with um, the middle schools and the high schools. It's just really exciting. So uh, thank you for that work. And then I'll stop there and let uh, Associate Superintendent Cox answer the second question. Yeah, I would just um, add to what Senior Officer Moore said, that we had many of our schools have new um, types of special education programming in their buildings. So our, our department really worked with them to make sure that they were welcoming all families um, into their uh, into the building that we had spaces identified so as parents were taking virtual tours they could really see where their student might be. Um, I would also say that we are watching the numbers very closely weekly um, in regards to our students receiving special education services and we are in constant communication with those principals adding support where we need it um, as we look at enrollment numbers so that will be happening all through the summer. I will say for the appeals process um, for those um, for those 32 families, they are getting an intensive support through the transition. For the other families who um, did not get their um, their placement appealed um, approved, um, we know that we have contacted those support staff in buildings to make sure that transition goes smoothly and to make sure that they're helping through that. I do appreciate your um, suggestion, Director Caprini. I'm going to follow up with our placement director to make sure that our principals are also notified because I think that makes a huge difference for families to feel welcome. So I appreciate that um, comment and suggestion. Thank you. Uh, director Arneson, are there any questions in the room? Yes, thank you. Uh, student representative. Student representative. So I was... The things that are, oh, am I not pressing it? Oh, sorry. Um, what are the things? Oh, right. Yeah, it wasn't oh, on okay. before, but now it's on. Yeah. Oh, okay. When it's green, it's on. There you go. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, what are some of the things that are being done to continue um, the high poverty um, um, And then, is it appeals? Sorry for the interruption, student representative Gavrinesko. Can you just speak right into the mic? Very close. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, what are some of the things that are I'm um, going to continue to be done to um, reduce the concentration of um, high poverty in certain schools. And then will the appeals committee focus on the mental health of students um, transitioning into different schools in Minneapolis? Okay, I'll, I'll make sure I heard the question um, that you asked. The first one was, what are, what are we doing to address the um, racial disparities in terms of the population within the buildings, is that right? Oh, the poverty, the high concentration of poverty. How are we addressing that in our buildings? And then the second question was, will we continue to focus on the mental health supports of those? Will the appeals committee continue to focus on supporting the mental health? Okay. So the first one, um, what are we doing to address the high concentrations of poverty? Uh, there are a number of strategies that we've been looking at. One had to do with how we set up our, um, our I guess, uh, guidelines of what our targets on what we wanted to accomplish in terms of uh, the the poverty numbers, and I'll ask Senior Officer Moore to, to restate those so I don't miss um, misspeak and, and say what those numbers are. But we were trying to find target populations, target numbers, and our goal was to, through our policy and through our monitoring of um, how we moved our um, our lottery, that we thought we could manage some of that through the, through the, the lottery itself. Um, the second question you asked, I'll ask Associate Superintendent Cox to speak to, but I think it was, again, how are we ensuring that we're, through the appeals process, still working to support the mental health of students in the cases where they didn't receive the appeals? 
Senior Officer Moore, could you take the first and maybe explain again that range that we were hoping to target with our concentration of, of poverty? And then um, describe a little bit about how those, those targeted numbers and the, the monitoring of the lottery process could support our, our goals. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent Charleston, uh, Board Member uh, Gabriel Meskel. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so, so our lottery, you know, as we looked at our, our student placement uh, uh, policy and regulations, uh, we wanted to ensure that our magnets uh, uh, our placement process uh, would reflect the district average for free and reduced lunch. And, and the, the number we landed on uh, was 60%. And then we said that, um, uh, so 60%, so we didn't want our magnets, as we're looking at those kindergarten numbers, our goal is uh, that we want to make sure that our, our magnets were 60%. Percent free and reduced lunch and 40%, uh, or 60% uh, free and reduced lunch and 40% non free and reduced lunch. And so, uh, through guidelines, uh, uh, we, we place uh, is essentially what you have is you have two separate lotteries um, and you have slots reserved for both free and reduced lunch and non free and reduced lunch. Um, and, then, and then that is supports. Uh, uh, having those integrated opportunities. Uh, as mentioned before, though, the, the challenge, um, uh, one, this is why we showed the kindergarten numbers and the sixth grade numbers. Um, you know, we we provide, we one of our values was to uh, support families staying in those locations that were turning into magnets and or if they're formerly of a magnet, we allow them to transition um, to a new magnet uh, in, with the same theme. I, I want to just point out one of the challenges of this work um, is that we have a, an extremely segregated city uh, by, uh, by, by poverty as well as race. And, and ultimately, I think that the biggest thing we can address, address in terms of reducing those numbers, uh, certainly we can address market share. So we, so there are families that aren't attending in those attendance area that we're going to pull back with stronger programming in our community schools. We're going to pull those families back and they're going to um, help diversify our, our school locations. But we're going to need to partner with the city on having affordable housing throughout the city of Minneapolis. Uh, ultimately, that's how you're going to get uh, those numbers to dramatically shift. Uh, there's areas of the city that does not have uh, affordable housing, and, and so that does impact um, uh, our ability to economically integrate. Uh, we are seeing some positive signs again in our magnets, and, and we, I do believe we'll see some positive signs uh, as we increase the market share in, in our local uh, attendance areas. Uh, we believe a stronger academic programming, you know, though, um, you know that that we're gonna um, we're gonna increase enrollment and then also economically uh, integrate our schools as much as possible. And again, the big constraint is when you look at economic integration outside of our magnets. You look at our community schools um, it, it is the is the affordable housing and the lack of economic diversity uh, that you see um, throughout the city. And, and that's something we need to partner with with the uh, city government on the mayor as well as the city council. Did that answer your question? Yes, thanks, Senior Officer Moore. If I could have Associate Superintendent Cox just speak to again the supports that we have around mental health and how the appeal committee is assisting with not only making sure that transition happens for our students this year, but the considerations um, for the future. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent. So um, this, the students who appeals were approved um, and their families, uh, those are students who are receiving very intensive uh, mental health supports, both from our internal staff, as well as our partners, as well as also other, um, other agencies in our community. Um, so they'll be followed um, as they either stay in their placement or, or whatever uh, decision we made at that point. The 32 Two families um, who um, we have offered um, a support through the transition will be, each one will be assigned a mental health support specialist if they choose. And it's, of course, their, their choice, a mental health support specialist. And the reason we did that was we really wanted someone who could have that kind of a, a, a level up view, who could see what was happening at the school that they currently are attending and be able to make that transition of the supports with that um, to the new school. We know that 
staff may be changing. We just wanted to make sure there was someone who was walking that family through that transition. Our mental health support specialists are also very connected with the building uh, mental health teams. Um, so they will be able to help um, make sure that there's a warm handoff between the two. For the other families, we'll be watching and, and just making sure that if they need anything, um, as we move through, we know our internal staff, um, our so school social workers, our school psychologists, our school counselors are really going to be watching those families to make sure that they're welcomed and that the supports are moving forward. And as I said, our agencies um, are very aware of what's happening in the CDD. They know, um, are working with their families on um, school transitions and making sure that they're working together and they have all the information they need to either offer the same support so the student doesn't have to change providers or doing a warm ham off to that um, new provider at the new school. I will say the reason why it was so important to me that the district mental health team was part of the um, the appeals process um, and, and, and sitting on that is this is not only an individual student, but I also want to make sure we were looking at the systems work, right? And so I think you're getting to that when you say, how are we how are we moving forward? And we started to hear what services families really valued um, in their appeals and wanting to make sure that we have that consistently across the district so that no matter what school you go to, um, whether it's a pathway, a choice, a magnet, um, all those services are, are very standard across. And so that was really important to me that we were looking um, at those systems pieces mm -hmm. too. Um, you know, as just as a reminder to our families out there, our mental health hotline will continue to operate through the summer. We'll have those services available. Also, um, you know, if you feel like your student needs something and they're in summer programming, um, uh, we have a school-based mental health a partner at every school as well as a school social worker who are there to meet those students needs if your student isn't in summer school call the hotline and we'll get you connected to more supports as we're going on and then really looking um, this week our teachers um, have the opportunity to attend a mental health institute um, we're having two strands one for classroom teachers and our ESP staff and one um, that's more of a deeper expertise for our school social workers school counselors licensed school nurses and school uh, school psychologist. Um, so really looking forward. Um, I know we're, we're halfway through that and really excited about the learning that's happening there. We're also going to be offering that in the fall for those teachers who couldn't and other staff who couldn't participate um, this week with summer school starting everything. It was a really busy, busy week. Um, so we'll be moving forward with that and also looking forward as part of the parent participatory evaluation process. Our parents said they were really interested in having a parent institute, so we're working on that this summer also. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important, especially for a lot of those students who didn't um, get their appeals to be heard, that they can be received in the district in those classes. Thank you, student rep, um, Deborah Meskel. Um, Director Jordan, I saw your hand up and I saw your hand go down. Just want to make sure you have an opportunity to speak. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, I believe uh, <coughs> I believe Rochelle Cox answered answered my uh, question I was thinking of. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Arneson? Thank you. Uh, I just want to check Director Inns, Director Ali. Do either of you have questions? No. Nope. Okay. Um, great. Well, I do have a uh, couple questions slash comments. If if we have a moment, if that's okay, I'm just going to take my mask off so you can hear me. Okay. So um, one, I just want to thank you all for for presenting. I'm kind of looking both ways. The superintendents to my right, and the screen is in front of me where I can see um, Associate Superintendent Cox and Senior Officer Moore. So. Forgive me as I kind of go back and forth here. It's a little awkward. All right, but I do want to thank all of you for being here tonight and for um, providing this information. I think this is a really good opportunity to monitor so many of the goals that we talked about during this CDD process. And uh, many, it, it's a very clear um, highlight. So I really appreciate this discussion tonight. I have a couple, just a couple of. Um, rather brief clarifying questions, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, the first, I, I just say them both. The first uh, is with the high school enrollment. I'm really glad to see more balanced numbers. I know that was a really um, 
important goal with uh, with this project. Uh, that said, I noticed that the south numbers appear outside of our um, goal, I guess, of our ideal number. And so I am just wondering if that, if we think that's related to boundaries, if it's just a large number of students who live in those boundaries, or if that might be related to something something different, maybe a citywide program, or or if we're expecting those numbers to it's just kind of the transition and we expect those numbers um, to evolve. It looks like we have still pretty much close to 500 students per class, which would, you know, put the school at around 2,000 students, which I think is higher than we were, we were hoping for. So that's my first question. And then my second question is about the special education. Uh, special education. First, I just have a comment and just say I'm really pleased uh, to see that such a high percentage of families with, with children with special education needs uh, participated or um, in the expressed interest in our magnet schools. I know that was something we specifically talked about uh, with the CDD and that that was not happening in many of our magnet schools and it just really wasn't accessible to special um, for children who need have some extra special education needs. So I'm excited about that. And wondering, and this is more about placement, it, not necessarily appeals, but just wanting to confirm, if I recall, we were working um, individually with, or in a small scale, I guess, with families or children who have IEPs and thinking about their placement. And so it might have happened in the appeal process, but it might have happened actually before, like kind of in the initial placement. So just wanting, it wasn't specifically mentioned in the appeals, but I, I, I believe and just wanting to confirm that we took into consideration IEPs and um, like services at schools and 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 that that um, process so those are my two clarifying questions superintendent if you want to mind yeah thank you uh, director Arneson for your, your questions I'll, I'll first um, ask associate superintendent Cox to respond to the special ed one but want to make sure I'm um, also signaling the the second one which was around Specifically, you're looking at the ninth grade placement trends, I believe. And you mentioned South as in South High School or just the general? Okay. Um, and so, Senior Officer Moore, I think the question coming up for you is we noticed that uh, the numbers for the South High um, are right up for ninth graders are right around, nine, uh, excuse me, right around 500. And just doing simple math, and you add that over the course of the high school career, that seems to be a very large population. So, how are we? Yeah, four classes. So, how are we managing that? Or uh, do we anticipate that those numbers will, will hold at that level? Or just kind of the cause is that just kind of an anomaly? Is it related? I guess I guess what I'm getting at is is it related to the boundaries? <laughs> is the boundaries like or do we accurately predict the boundaries? Is that, are we comfortable with that number related to the boundaries? I guess. Got it. Okay. So, uh, Superintendent Associate Superintendent Cox, could you could you speak to the special education uh, question, which was really around what are what were the considerations for students with special education and their placement? And I know uh, the individualized education plan is a is a key element of that consideration. Um, and I also just wanted to reinforce the acknowledgement of our our prioritization and our focus around special education throughout the comprehensive district design. Um, you know, with close to 20% of our students qualifying for those services, I think you can see throughout the process that we've had and even the communication and presentation tonight how special education students um, continue to be lifted up and acknowledged as a critical part of our our um, redesign of the district and the supports for them. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Associate Superintendent Cox. Thank you. Yes, we um, so we are ecstatic about what's happening at the magnet uh, programs and um, really reaching out to the principals, really gearing up for support mm -hmm. and yeah, really wanting to make sure that those um, citywide programs or programs that have specific disability areas for our students receiving more intensive services are really mirroring and being inclusive of the programming of the magnet. So yeah, if you are in a program for students with autism uh, and you're at the magnet, 
magnet um, for arts, you're going to see arts in your citywide program um, just as well as when you're included, as well as when you're in your um, in your special education classroom. So very excited about that. We really focused um, on those federal those students receiving federal setting three, and so those students who are getting more intensive services, as well as spending more of their time in special education than they are general education. We wanted to first make sure that A number one, we were following the same um, what I'll call rules um, as, as general education. So those students who are already in a high school, we were not going to move them. We were committed to keeping them where they were so that they were able to do that. The other piece that we really looked at was making sure that those students who were uh, federal setting three students did not have um, places where they were um, moving between three schools. So we tried to really reduce um, their transitions, especially at grade um, four, five, and and seven, eight, um, and so those kind of big transition years, we looked at making sure that we keep kids where they were so they wouldn't have um, have three transitions in a row um, as we were moving forward. You know, I know that our teams are, are doing a tremendous job of um, moving materials, um, moving interventions. We're having everything turned really back into our uh, professional instructional center so we can kind of relook at it, make sure everything is complete and then we're looking at the profiles of each of our classrooms in each of our schools so that when they arrive we actually are going to have the interventions that we feel would work best for those students already at the school so that we don't have a leg or a wait for those interventions of course as teachers get to know their students and as, as IEP teams make decisions they can move in and out of interventions but we really um, were committed and I just can't say enough about our department staff as well as our teachers and our special education assistants who have been working so hard over the last couple of weeks to really make sure that we are ready to go for students and are able to pick up those interventions and that specialized services starting uh, day one when students are in their new site. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to answer uh, your question, uh, Director Arneson, uh, Carlson, Superintendent. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the, the question because I, I, one of the, you know, I'm, I'm actually very confident in, in those numbers declining. Um, I, I think the dependency will be uh, the, the dual language program at Anderson. Um, and, and so um, I'm expecting anywhere from 50 to 100 students that would normally go to South, so they're normally pathway to South. They'll actually end up in Roosevelt as we build up that dual language program. So there's a pathway uh, from the dual language uh, program at the middle school at Anderson that will feed into Roosevelt. Uh, so that will gradually decrease the, those numbers at South. So, um, but those numbers will gradually decline each year um, as the, the Anderson program becomes more successful. Uh, so so I, I am confident that we'll get that down to you near know, to 17, uh, 1800, maybe even uh, larger eventually or, or less, um, you know, as we build up the Anderson program. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so I, thank you so much. So those were my quick cl clarifying questions. I have more of a comment, if it's okay. Chair, if you still have a couple minutes for that. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay, good. Um, what I just wanted to highlight, and Superintendent, feel free to expand upon this, but I... Um, uh, wanted um, to highlight uh, just the, and appreciate again that we have one of the metrics that we were really looking at is our small, our very small schools with less than 250 students, and that we're decreasing the numbers there. But also some of our magnet schools, um, their their classes are a little bit smaller, and wanting to really give a genuine opportunity for all of our schools to um, build the enrollment that they need. And so just wanting to to highlight the opportunity that. The kind of fortunate opportunity that we have from these federal dollars to give us a bit of a buffer. So just just wanting to highlight that um, it is a role of our. Uh, we are going to need to have. A, a, it's difficult to support schools that have less than 250 students, not only financially, but the opportunities, as we discussed extensively during the CDD. The opportunities are um, really just fewer for those students. So we want to build that up, but it's also nice that we have um, some financial cushion. Cushion. 
soon, I would say, to um, to give us some time to do that and for communities to truly buy into the school that's near their home. Also, a uh, very specific thing of the federal dollars allowing us to expand our early childhood programming in some of these buildings and what a nice opportunity that will be for, for particularly these magnet schools. So, so I'm wanting to highlight that. That's my one comment. Feel free to expand upon that, Superintendent, but I just felt like we should highlight that for sure. Oh, looks like you want to expand. <laughs> yeah, if now's an okay time. Yeah, so I, um, the reference to the, the federal dollars, um, specifically, you know, the, the funding received in uh, elementary, secondary, emergency relief dollars one and two, um, we do have a opportunity to address some of the um, early childhood um, uh, work that we've been doing for so long now in Minneapolis public schools and, and targeted that. Um, but when you look at the ESSER three dollars, um, which we do not have our application uh, completed yet, that submission is due on October 1st. We have heard um, definitely the, the opportunity from the federal government to be able to stabilize um, what they refer to as your, your stabilization of staffing through this pandemic. And so because of what you just described and the, the commitment that we've made to our school communities around shoring up um, resources so that they can be uh, supportive of well-rounded well education, as well as accelerating some of those investments that we know are beneficial for students, um, we'll be able to capture those dollars moving forward. So those will be considerations that we'll be making based on the feedback that we receive from Again, our community advisory group, but just the general um, commitment that the board has made through the board budget priorities and values. Um, so we anticipate that you know the timing of those funds um, is is great for us because that is what we have said all along that we're going to commit to, and it aligns very well with the stabilization of, of staffing. You know, not having to make those reductions or make those um, decisions about what programs we're not going to offer because we don't have enough student enrollment in those schools. We can avoid that um, because of the support that we're receiving from those ESSER three dollars. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's helpful, and I think it's really important to just to just highlight that. And so, my final comment uh, before I turn it over to Director Inns, who has a, a question, it sounds like I just wanted to um, compliment and and be note out loud that our racially isolated schools have decreased by 50%. And what, um, how that was, a, again, a really major conversation. And it's been a major conversation since I've been on the board. This is the largest decrease I've seen, for sure, since I've been on the board, which is over 10 years. So, and the, the fact that there are less extreme numbers even in our racially isolated schools certainly suggests that um, we're on the right track. And there's always, we talk about marketing, um, and there was, and I just want to make a comment about that. There's always, there's always a push and pull, it feels like, between market share and marketing and, and our uh, offering quality education in our schools and who should be marketing and district support and principals. But what I, I what I want to say, when we talk about market share and we talk about uh, 60 percent, uh, 40 percent of families choosing some other some other school and we talk about um, um, Mr. Moore talked a little bit about uh, who is um, buying into magnets and who's, who wasn't and I, I just I feel like it's important to state at least out loud at least in my community but I think in through all of Minneapolis the connection between race and class and school choice and the importance of being able to be really clear in Minneapolis public schools about our values and the value of integration and our um, belief that that's important. Because I know that in my, in throughout Minneapolis, we're, this is a conversation we're struggling with, with race, a, a conversation about race, but it absolutely applies to schools. And I was just having a conversation as someone who was discouraged today in her um, child is at one of our summer school programs, their Minneapolis public school parent. And she noted that there were a variety of families um, taking uh, using our summer school program, we offer our summer school program to all families, uh, people who go to Minneapolis public schools throughout the year and people who don't. And talking to some families who were very clear that they were there for the summer, but not ongoing, and their reasons were absolutely about race and class. So sometimes it's not about our schools, it's not about what our schools have to offer, but it's about the students who are in the schools. So I, I think we just always have to remember that and not apologize for our students, but rather embrace it and be clear 
clear about our values and um, just be aware that that's a factor. We should be, we are, of course, we're aware. We should be not afraid to state that that is, it is at least in part of um, part of our enrollments and part of our, you know, quote unquote, market share. So something to think about. So, okay, uh, Director Inns, I think you have a question. Uh, thank you, um, Director Arneson. Um, I, I did uh, have a few comments I wanted to make and then sort of a general question. Um, can you, you, you can hear me okay, right? I don't, yeah. So uh, uh, first I want to say I'm uh, really grateful that um, for one thing in particular that our SPED students, our special education students are given so many choices and have so many opportunities within our district. And I think that's a really unique thing and uh, uh, certainly a, a really positive, great outcome of the CDD. And I'm glad to see that um, families are taking advantage of that. And hopefully, as people are more aware of that opportunity, they'll take even more advantage of it. And it, it might be, you know, I know we are already, in some cases, a draw for many special education families. Um, but it's good that we can be even more so and provide that service to families in need. Um, so I'm really uh, grateful for that. Um, I, I really appreciate the comment or question of uh, student representative Geber Meskel about um, ongoing mental health support. Um, and I think that's something that we ought to uh, continue to think about um, other areas where we can provide mental health support for students. Um, in this case, you know, we have a sort of a almost esoteric situation where we need to provide supports for students, but it seems like it's a natural area where we can provide more support for students in transitions. And maybe we ought to look at a more formalized Hmm. ongoing uh, process yeah, for dealing with students in transition um, and providing mental health support for students in transition in the, within the district and from outside the district and around the district. That might be part of our regular structure going forward. Um, and uh, um, I'm also really grateful that so many of the things that we projected or hoped that would happen seem to be happening. Um, uh, you know, you, you're, there's a degree of faith that you have that things will work. Um, and certainly we're, you know, the school year hasn't started yet and, you know, things can change. And, um, you know, we, we always, there, there are in many cases differences, but you know, a lot of our indicators are good. To that point, um, what are some of the things that maybe we're in a general sense not sure about? and? might need to adjust as we go forward. Don't Think, you know, the, the red flags, for lack of a better word, or um, areas where we maybe don't have enough information yet to know what's happening or what's going to happen. Um, I know that uh, probably there are some of these things already um, that are showing up. And I know, uh, you know, we're always looking at information and data. Um, so I guess to that point, I'm kind of like wondering what are some of the holes maybe in the data or information, things that we don't know, um, and what are we going to do about that? And then I had just a really like a m tiny minute question. I'm wondering about the free and reduced lunch data again. And I know that last year and uh, there was a lot of problems in gathering free and reduced lunch data. And I'm wondering how that process is going. And th this is going to sound like a dumb question, but like, what is the data on the data? So for instance, you know, how much information do we get back from people? Um, you know, do we keep track of that? Do we have like a, of the people that we requested that filled out the form? I know every, we ask everybody to fill out the income forms and for a lot of people, they don't want to do it. You know, it's like, um, so has that, has that gone down? Um, has that gone down in particular places? Like when I look at the um, Wellstone free and reduced lunch data, you know, that to me is like a, oh, maybe people aren't filling out those forms. Um, and that's why we're not getting that. And, you know, we talked about that at, at a couple of the meetings, but I'd like to see some more information about that and at that school in particular as well. Um, and I want to know what we're doing about that. Um, so, and then I just want to sum up, like I want to sort of echo some of the um, comments of Director Arneson. Um, 
And I, I want to sort of pull back and take a look at the big picture here and note that, you know, we, we started this process obviously a long time ago. There's been a lot of different things that have driven what we've done and we've sort of, everything's been sort of sifted down and distilled at some point or another. And we got to a point where we said, you know, our schools are more segregated than our city is granted our city oh is that my uh, hair buzzer my time's up now <laughs> but uh our schools are more segregated than our city and so we're gonna do what we can about that our choice process is contributing to greater segregation in our schools than we have in our city um and uh i you know i think that i am proud of the fact that we have done what we can um, but we have to continue to remember that those are our values, as Director Arneson said, and that is, that is what we're trying to achieve through this process. So we have to keep that lens on things. Um, we are not going to be able to, as Minneapolis Public Schools and as the Minneapolis School Board, we're not going to be able to solve school segregation. We're not going to be able to do it, you know, and uh, we can do what we can. But there are so many other entities and policies and forces at play that we have no control over. Um, you know, we have state policies that we have to accept. We have federal policies. And then we have free will um, of, among people, you know. And uh, all those things come into play and impact where we are. So when I think about this past month and the school integration lawsuit and just the idea that school districts are being sued, or not really school districts, but states, right? And then they try to kind of pass the buck down to the school districts, I think. Um, uh, uh, like, it's impossible task that we're being handed, and it's, it's not really right. And also, to expect us to make changes that are going to solve this problem is really denying the nature of the problem, and it, it's not going to help. So I'm proud that we're doing what we can. We're not going to be able to fix everything. Uh, and certainly we're not going to be able to solve the issue of school, school segregation as a school board. Um, but, um, you know, I am proud of the work that we have done. So uh, and with that, I guess I'll turn it maybe back to either Superintendent Graff for a comment on what, you know, what we're looking at and maybe um, also uh, 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 senior Officer Moore. Senior I don't know. Officer Moore. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Director Enns, for your comments. I think um, just to start with where you ended, uh, we are continuing to work to create conditions for success, you know, and if I've learned anything in the last 16 months or 18 months, whatever it's been through the pandemic, it's the importance and significance of public education in what we value and how we communicate those values. To your point, we will not be able to undo what exists within our city. Um, at the same time, we have taken approach of dismantling and redesigning our structures and our systems with our policies, and that is a both a, a necessary and a bold move because we know the implications of what that means should nothing else happen in our city. Those are the steps we can take. And so I uh, appreciate your comments with it. I appreciate the board's commitment of the, the values and uh, helping us continue to move down that path, knowing that we are going to have to make adjustments. Um, as you mentioned, the support of mental health and the, the need for maybe us to consider how do we assist in transitioning that. That is something that has universally come up again, time and time again when we talk about what do we need to do to, to move through this pandemic and into the future. It's to have that mental health support and that idea of transition is so critical from our earliest learners coming into school. Uh, from our elementary students transitioning to middle school and into high school, as well as just a general transition. So I, I do appreciate you lifting that up and know that that has been part of a discussion already and with our, our um, advisory group around mental health and student representative Deborah Meskel has been uh, a big part of that. So I look forward to um, more progress in those conversations moving forward. Um, you also mentioned around uh, um, what, what will be different or what haven't we seen yet with, uh, with um, 
you know, data perhaps, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of the speculative things and then maybe ask Senior Officer Moore to, to talk about that, what he sees from a data lens, as well as um, we might need to come back to getting more information on the free and reduced lunch because I, I have, again, you know, some anecdotal comments that I've heard from people around just how difficult it is to, to capture that data. And I think we are also faced with a balance of respecting where individuals are with their privacy, and the, the cautiousness of you know, the application and filling out forms. I think we've heard from staff and, and other members of uh, the district who have children in the, in the school district who have said, I've been asked to fill out the forms you know, repeatedly, and we're trying to do it in a way that uh, does not encroach on someone's decision, but also lets them know like this is valuable information that we um, can utilize. So I would say we probably want to try and get more information um, for you specifically around Wellstone, what does that look like? Um, and then just what do those numbers look like as we compare across the district? I know in talking with our, our, our government uh, relations lobbyist, uh, Josh Downham, he's, he's significantly said the challenges is there you know, across the state, but um, I can get more information on that. Regarding the what we don't know around data, um, I think again we're, we're mindful that these are projections, and this is what we have today. Um, I will acknowledge we're still transitioning from a space of a 18 months or whatever it's been of a pandemic into maybe a new space and a new era, um, and, and new opportunities for families where they're partaking in summer experiences, which might influence their decisions again in the fall, um, as well as we've expanded some of our, our, um, our, our discussions around our, our lottery and how would we look at our lottery and monitor that carefully. As mentioned tonight, you know, we did our first lottery draw and did we get enough information out to families with that? So I think that Again, more messaging around the lottery and what the outcomes are of lottery um, re requests, I think, could change some of those numbers going forward. Um, and, and just knowing that the word of mouth transition will also play into that. As families settle into their new school, they'll have a reaction to it. Uh, uh, optimistically and hopefully it'll be positive, but also knowing that it's an, it's an individual experience. And so I think that will play a huge part in how we respond to those situations. Um, so those are a few of the, just the kind of the reflections I have around it, but I'll turn it over to um, Senior Officer Moore and see if he has any more specifics around data or anything further to add around the free and reduced lunch. Um, kind of indication that we've seen over the last several months. Thank you, Superintendent uh, Chair Olson, uh, uh, Director Enns. I, I really do appreciate that, you know, I'll just elaborate, the superintendent mentioned uh, the data. So, so these are projections based upon a new model. Um, and, and so our, our projection model, uh, we had a bit more leeway because as we uh, uh, you know, had wider attendance areas, we, we had more of a zone approach. Uh, we were able to place students in different locations. We're now in an attendance area. Essentially, that's where students attend school. Uh, so, so as we're making projections, uh, I'm waiting to see what the data looks like in October, uh, actually September, to see if our projections are holding true. Uh, after 21-22, our projections will be stronger because we'll clearly know who attends a particular school. Uh, so, so we're just transitioning, and I, I think uh, very blessed to, to have some additional resources through ESSER uh, to help us transition uh, through a year that, that's, that's unknown. Uh, so I think that's the, the big piece, is these are projections. Um, you know, we do what we can, and, and what, what is our control? And as mentioned, that we talked about integration and, and the availability of housing. What's in our control is to have stronger schools and to address some of the, the inequities across our, our district relative to zip code. And so I do believe we're entering 21 22. Uh, with a, 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 a very, uh, very concrete approaches to address those inequities. The ability for us to be successful, this is very a technical plan at the beginning. Now we're moving into the adaptive phase, which is climate, and, and it's going to be imperative that our, our principal and our teachers at our schools embrace those new families. So when we talk about our projections, we know that students are identified to attend school. Now it's going to come down to 
uh, the extent to which our funds will continue to walk in those new communities in relative to our climate framework. I've seen some very nice signs, even of students, uh, as I shared uh, previous, uh, previous board member. Uh, where students are welcoming other students. I mean, that's climate. It's, it's that personal touch. It's the relationship uh, approach now. This is on relationships. That's really going to allow those families to feel welcome as they move to the new community. And that's the adaptive work we talk about. The technical work is changing the boundaries, uh, uh, changing the approach from more of a zone model uh, to a community school model of having centralized magnets. Uh, but now we're going through the phase of, of our principals showing their models of leadership, our teachers showing their leadership and embracing their families and making people feel welcome. I do believe we have stronger schools so moving forward. But directions, I, I, I do think is, these are projections that the student mentioned. And, uh, and so I'm waiting to see to what extent our projections. The first year we've attempted to do this, um, going to a community school model. Uh, for the first year, to what extent do they hold true or not? Uh, and then I'm very confident because of our team, um, both at the superintendent, senior, uh, senior level, my colleagues, our principal, that we're going to meet our outcomes uh, as identified in the CED. And again, this is the first year, and I'm so very positive with the data that, that we're sharing. Um, but I, I look forward to the next presentation uh, to see uh, the actual. And, and to see what we need to build upon. But there will be something that we need to build upon in this intervention. Certainly the lottery, I'm very excited. Next year, as we're in person, uh, we did have previously have plans to get on the ground and do outreach and, and do the mobile uh, enrollment registration. So I'm very confident we do have a plan uh, to, again, increase the number of folks that are, are participating in our lottery process next year. Um, but but uh, it's a uh, testament to the team and, and to uh, those that work in Minneapolis and the families. We, we were working through a pandemic. We worked through a lot of emotional uh, work uh, and still working through that with, uh, with all the events that have happened in our city regarding race and uh, police brutality. Um, and, and so we, we come forward and, and, and we're ready to go in the fall and, and I think we'll have a be a stronger yeah, Minneapolis public schools, but looking forward to seeing the numbers and presenting that to all of you uh, to see the extent to which our assumptions hold. And I do, I, I'm kind of fired up. I, I'm very happy with uh, um, the direction we're heading, and uh, thank you all for, for your support as a, as a board that puts the issues of equity and race at the forefront. Uh, that That's really important to folks, so, so thank you, board members, for that, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, um, directors, for your questions. Um, Director Surio, do you have any questions or comments? This time? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I wanted to um, uh, go back into the mental support issue. I mean, that's something that is very dear and personal to me. Uh, and uh, I'm extremely grateful that our district actually, you, we do have uh, therapists on site. That's something that is not the reality for other districts. And um, I, I want to ask, uh, uh, so we mentioned that um, we have therapists on every single school, correct? And uh, now, how do we ensure also that we do have therapists that are bilingual and bicultural uh, when it comes to like schools like Anderson, for example, and uh, Jefferson too? So do we have enough therapists and how do we ensure that we do provide that support? Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Surya, thank you for your, your support and uh, comments regarding the, the mental health, uh, uh, school-based mental health um, supports that we have. Uh, I will ask Associate Superintendent Cox to get a little more, more detail on it. What we do have right now are contracts um, at all of our schools, and so to be clear that it, that is supported. Um, did take place this past spring, and it's um, something that we recognize was a need, and we were grateful to be able to, to make those contacts and those, those connections. Um, but specifically to your question on how do we ensure that we have um, individuals who are culturally and uh, represent uh, uh, you know, language needs of support, I'll ask Associate Superintendent Cox to kind of give, give an update on how we monitor that. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so each of our agencies has to go through a, a RFP uh, process. So they go through a pretty stringent um, review and um, being able to um, have cultural relevancy and competency that matches our schools is one of our number one priorities. Um, once they make it into that, that pool and we kind of then they get to be in the pool, um, each of our schools has the opportunity to um, interview each of the um, the uh, agencies to look for matches um, for um, demographics, who their therapists are, uh, looking at cultural uh, competency of the agency as we move forward. Um, we also realize that being able to support Minneapolis public schools, it takes some infrastructure for an agency, right? And so we realize that we have a lot of expertise in our community, both with um, our external stakeholders and small agencies and individual mental health therapists, as well as we have a lot of expertise and cultural um, expertise in our district. So what we started this year was something we called the cultural co consultancy. And what we did was ask people to apply who thought that they had something to bring from a cultural aspect to Minneapolis public schools. Um, we accepted everybody and we offered them many grants um, so that we could connect them with schools who needed expertise and consultancy in the area of, of um, culture in, in relation to mental health uh, supports. Um, that has been one of the most exciting things we've done, and we've really been able to um, not only support our schools in a really different way and having them be in an interactive process with the consultants, but also to lift up the expertise of our community members as well as our internal staff to really provide support outside of their job role, or maybe they're not able to go through our RFP process because, as I said, it does take you know quite a bit of interest infrastructure to be able to do that. So we're really excited. We started that this spring. Several of them are also working with us for our Mental Health Institute this week. So we're really excited about that. And then they'll start a new contract. Um, we'll start out with, with small mini grants and as the need um, continues, we'll look at, re at funding those and providing additional funding. So um, just a shout out there, we'll continue to work with our networks to um, make sure we get the word out. And again, as I said, we really want to make sure that we are lifting up our community providers. Um, we're also, um, again, we also know our parents are experts, right? And so how do we lift them up and making them um, partners in this idea of supporting not only the mental health needs of our of our students and families, but also their wellness. So sometimes I think, um, I, I, I'm sometimes surprised when people are like, we don't have enough mental health supports. And I think, wow, we have a lot of mental health supports, right? Um, so why need to make sure that we're framing in a way that's culturally respected? so that people understand that mental health is not just about illness, but it's also about wellness, and that we're really supporting that through the district um, in all levels, um, in all grade levels, and then also our families. I think our agencies have done a great job, as well as our, our, our staff that work, for, that work in Minneapolis of uh, supporting families um, through the pandemic, and I think we'll continue to open that up to make sure that um, we're not only supporting just the students, but that whole family unit. Thank you. Um, Director Elamine. Director Elamine. Thank you, Chair Ellison, um, and everyone, good evening. I do apologize and I have been some issues with my camera, so I am here with this audio only. But I did wanted to just make um, several comments in regards to the adaptive piece or the plan. I'm glad to hear that the principals and associate superintendents will be working more closely to the families so that they're more accessible to our families within our community. But I'm also um, a little concerned about the numbers and I know we don't have everything yet and it won't be available until um, the start of next school year. With our schools trying to keep those numbers over the 200 within our inner city schools, um, I'm just hoping that we will continue to work diligently to make sure that we can do everything possible to make sure that those numbers 
member stay um, above that to prevent any type of closure or anything that may have to come to the table, but also to make sure that these adaptive piece um, is not just a temporary situation, that we make that the model and the expectation as we move on throughout our school years so that we are better to tell our stories and have more success stories to share within our community. So um, just those two concerns, I guess I wanted to just share and maybe one of you can give me some insight on that, please. Thank you. Director Amin, thank you for uh, your, your comments and acknowledging um, what I heard to be two pieces. One was just the, the close connection to our our families from our building administrators and uh, associate superintendents. And again, the role of the associate superintendent is to provide that, that support um, for the respective school they oversee and more specifically the, the building principal. Um, but certainly that has been the, the communication and the, the practice um, over the last several weeks of those transitions that are happening for, um, for families, you know, to make sure that we are as best as possible handing off those, those transitions so parents can start to feel the, the new environment and what that will be like for their child as they, um, they take on a new, new pathway of learning in that school or school community. And then regarding the, the numbers of uh, schools that we have that are under 250, that was again a, a very, um, very hotly debated conversation about how do we address the the low enrollment that we have throughout the district, and, and certainly we felt uh, a multifaceted approach was the best way to do that, looking at not only the, the programming and what we're offering, but the um, policies and practices that we have around our, our um, enrollment, as well as the, the boundary changes and the climate uh, framework, so a myriad of approaches to address a, a myriad of, of needs, but um, I think from, a, from an efficiency and from a, a financial practicality, you know, the school's enrollment has to be built up in order for it to be sustained. And so we need a conscious decision to, to move with a comprehensive design so that we could provide uh, conditions for success at all of our schools. And our commitment has been in the means, you know, for the next three years to uh, create the, the greatest opportunity for success. And as mentioned by, I think, a couple of other directors' conversations, you know, we, we have um, an amount of what we can control, and we're, we're going to continue to, to do that. Um, we also recognize that um, not everyone may be aligned to some of our values. Um, so it's incumbent upon us as we move forward each year with implementation to reevaluate where we are successful within our control and to be clear about messaging that um, those positive strengths and those things that are happening. So I appreciate you lifting that up and recognize that um, you know, we, we have made an induction of the number of schools on that um, list of less than 250. Um, but we have a few more that we want to work on. And I think, uh, again, it's, it's something that's going to happen um, to the best of our abilities um, over the next couple of years. So I appreciate um, the conversation around that. Thank, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, a couple of things that haven't come up. I, I am like. ขอเปิดขอเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเอ่อเ
。我找着呢，我这给我先得到。Chair、sure, Allison, I apologize for interrupting, but I'm having a hard time hearing you with the audio. And I, I know you have、um, information that、um, is really important for us to hear. So, if, if I could ask you, can you try and see if I can hear what you're saying? Okay, just speak. That's、okay. much better. Okay, good. Thank you.、Um, so I, I was thanking folks on the appeals process and just talking about personally the struggles that I've gone through、um, with some of the emails we received as a parent with four children, sometimes in three different schools. I was saying it's hard. It's a hard thing to do, and this was a choice that me and my family had made, but it's still difficult. I know some of the.、Um, Some of the emails that I'm getting are from parents with ninth graders who are being placed in schools different than their older siblings、um, in high school, and that was one thing I never ever had to deal with. So I mean, more than one child in a high school age in two different schools.、Um, and so as we go forward, I don't know what kind of changes we can make for this year, but as we talk about lessons learned,、um, I'm hoping that's something that we're looking at、um, how we're dealing with siblings specifically. Um, who either because of family circumstances have to move, or because of the different the lines that we've drawn, the new lines we've made,、um, their younger siblings. Charles, and thank you. Thank you for your comments. Again, I think that what I heard there is the the ongoing challenge of any time you take on a a boundary change like this. And I think that to the point that was made earlier, I'm not sure the director's comment about the number of schools we have and the population at the moment. Again, we're trying to. We're trying to create conditions for success across the district. And we have over 60 schools, and、um, see significant disparities of what programs are being offered to other schools, and recognize that the, the way to build up those programs is to be able to have resources in those schools. It does take a shift of、um, population, and, and we made the conscious decision to do this. This is over a period of time because we felt it was too critical for us to. To make this shift, you know, with the values that the board has shared and what we have heard to do, the board in terms of、um, our schools and、um, the board that we are having those those opportunities for kids, we we don't have years and years of experience. Uh, With one child, and will certainly be different with this child as they're coming into the space. And so I just again recognize that that's a difficult transition, and through every boundary change that I've been through,、um, you know these things continue to come up. And and just know that we'll we'll continue to monitor、uh, our process、um, moving forward in the future. But appreciate all the the care and commitment that people have provided at this point with the. With our process for making these transitions. Thank you, Superintendent. And you know, I, okay, I was one of those board members with all of you. I am completely behind this comprehensive district design. I believe in it、um, and want to see it 
So I believe it's going to be successful. It's going to work for our students to do the great things. So thank you, Superintendent. Seeing no more raised hands, um, if we can close out the discussion part of this evening, is there anything else you would like to say, Superintendent, in closing? Yes, I would uh, like to acknowledge that this is our final um, school board meeting for the 2021 school year, and um, I, I won't go into a great length of detail around um, what, what this means in terms of reflection, but I would just offer to uh, the board, uh, our staff, the, the public in general, General, but, you know, we've been through um, a lot um, this past year, and it, obviously an understatement, but throughout that, that time frame, we've had a lot of opportunities for us to, um, to celebrate some successes that we've had as well, and so I'd just like to encourage others to as we reflect back on the year as we close out this, this school year, um, you know, take some time to acknowledge the work that you've done, either in the classroom, in your department, um, in, in your position as a director. Uh, acknowledge that this has not been easy and it has not been um, something that you could have anticipated, but um, more than just surviving, I think we have, we have accepted the challenge and we have, uh, as mentioned already here, have have kind of doubled down our, our energy and our commitment to what we're doing. And so I just want to say thank you to the board um, for all the work that you've done and the support that you've provided for the district and our students, families, and staff. Thank you, Chair Allison. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, thank you, Senior Officer Moore, Associate Superintendent Pax and, and your teams, and thank you, Directors, for tonight and this conversation, this discussion. Um, I'm now going to adjourn tonight's meeting, our last meeting um, of the school year, like Superintendent said. Um, we will meet again in August. Please get outside, get some fresh air, take a breath, get some rest. Um, so thank you. Good night.